and welcome to one of our today's Tiger Alumni Week webinars, The Scary Truth, Drug-Resistant Bacteria. I am Tamara Werner, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the Colleges of Science and Health Sciences and Technology. I'll also be your moderator this evening. Before I begin, let's go over a couple of housekeeping points. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be answered in the chat box. So at any point, please feel free to write in your questions and we'll do everything we can to address them at the end of Dr. Hudson's presentation. We would like to thank our premier sponsor, Sharp Notions, as well as our Tiger sponsor, Rochester Regional Health, for helping us make this week's programming possible. We'd also like to thank our access team for helping us make this webinar accessible for all of our alumni. Real-time captioning is available within the webinar and our interpreter will be pinned spotlighted during the presentation. I wanna let you know how grateful we are to all the members of the RIT family who made a gift yesterday on Roar Day. These gifts have a direct and immediate impact on our students. If you haven't had the chance to make your gift, there's still time. If you go to rit.edu slash roar, we will count your gift in our Roar Day total. We just put it up on the screen for, for you, for your convenience. So let's start our session. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Andre Hudson, who will present the scary truth, the drug resistant bacteria. Dr. Hudson was born in the beautiful island of Jamaica, and he grew up in the town of Savannah Lamar in the parish of Westmoreland. He immigrated to the United States at the age of 14, and he completed high school at Celsian High in New Rochelle, New York. Dr. Hudson received his Bachelor of Science from Virginia Union University in 2000 and his PhD from the Department of Plant Biology and Pathology in 2006 under the direction of Dr. Thomas Luz Tech at Rutgers University. Dr. Hudson joined RIT College of Science faculty in the Thomas H. Gosnell School of Life Sciences in the fall of 2008, following his postdoctoral from Rutgers. Dr. Hudson now serves as the school head and professor in the College of Science and Life Sciences. Dr. Hudson, thanks for joining us this evening. It's all yours. Um, thank you very much, um, Tamara. It's um, a pleasure to be here. And um, I know I have a, a limited amount of time, so I'm going to kind of rapid fire to go through this presentation, but I'm looking forward um, to your questions um, at the end. So today I'll talk about um, the scary truth, um, drug resistance, bacteria, and some of the things that we're doing um, in my lab um, and in the scientific community regarding um, um, looking for novel targets um, with respect to antibiotic um, development. Yeah. So um, as Tamara said, real quick, I am, um, I'm a lover of all things Bob Marley. Um, if you know me, you know that I'm a huge fan of Bob Marley and reggae music in general. Um, my favorite game is chess. I um, love to play chess. Uh, actually, it kind of um, kind of shaped my personality um, with respect to how I approach problems and um, how I lead. It's kind of like thinking like a chess player. Um, as Tamara said, I was born on the island of Jamaica and uh, on this um, little coastal um, town called Savile and Amar, um, pictured here. Um, and I joined the faculty um, at RIT in 2008. So there are three big things um, in, in, in biology or in the world um, that, um, that are pertinent and we need to look at. One of them is climate change, um, which you're probably familiar with. The other one is plastic pollution, uh, which is this anthropogenic compound that has been um, designed. It's, it has been around for a long time and um, it's, it, it's a huge um, problem with respect to um, causing pollutions in, in, in land and in, in aquatic systems. And the other one is antibiotic resistance. And now here I have this uh, math problem. It says seven plus two equals nine, which kind of seems simple, right? But what it means is that currently we have seven billion uh, people on earth. And by the year, <coughs> excuse me, by the year 2050, we're slated to have 2 billion additional humans on earth, right? So we're gonna have 9 billion people on earth by 2050. And we need to kind of um, come up with ways to solve a lot of these problems even before we get there. And so how do we, um, how do we address um, some of these problems? Well, a brief history of antibiotics or antibiotics are these uh, fascinating compounds that basically um, inhibit bacterial growth, right? Um, so they, they either have what is called a bacteriostatic effect. So they kind of um, 
um, lower the growth rate of bacteria or they kill it, um, what we call a bacterial saddle effect. And they were kind of um, in vogue um, in, the, in 1928 when Alexander Fleming uh, um, discovered, um, um, discovered penicillin and he put it out um, there and it was the kind of the first big um, um, mass marketed um, antibiotic um, um, that we know today. In the 1940s, actually, Salman Waxman uh, from my alma mater, Rutgers University, um, discovered streptomycin, um, uh, which um, which was a big deal because it was used um, to cure a lot of ailments um, that at that time was including tuberculosis and others that was really, really dependent on having this um, drug. And if you notice from the 1960s to 19, uh, between 1960 and 1980, there was cyclosporine, rapamycin, synthetic penicillin, tetracycline, and a few others um, that were um, synthesized and um, or discovered and actually used um, in um, for medicinal uh, purposes. But so if you look at the news, all right, you see all of these things about how we need to come up with new antibiotics, and antibiotics are necessary. And um, it, 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 if you if you're not familiar with the literature, you would think it's alarmist. It's like, you know, it's very, very alarming, but it's actually real. We do really, really have a big problem, right? Um, here's a recent quote um, from Stephen Rutherford, uh, who is a scientist at Genentech, and he said, the challenge with bacteria is that they have a short generation time, right? And so a genetic mutation that promotes survival in the presence of a drug, in this case, an antibiotic, can rapidly lead to an entire population with a survival advantage. Right. So to stay ahead, we need to constantly search for new weak points uh, that can be targeted to develop new antibiotics, because a lot of the antibiotics are pretty much all of them that are used in a medicinal setting uh, currently do not work or work as well. So what leads to antibiotic resistance? Right. There are clinical factors, biological factors, natural evolutionary factors, economic factors, and also political factors. And I'll go through uh, um, a few of these, right? Um, this um, chart um, here shows that um, the, depending on your income level will depend, it's dependent on how much antibiotic you have access to and how much antibiotic you use, right? And um, this, um, um, this graph or, 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 or this map on in B um, shows that um, a look at the amount of antibiotics that are used in farming, just specifically for chickens. So we're not even talking about cattle. We're just talking about chicken. Looking at the antimicrobial consumption in chickens in 2010. And a lot of this is driven by farming, right? So you actually use excess antibiotics in not only in the medicinal setting, but also in the farming setting as well. Right. So why are we here today? Well, the problem is that between the, you know, if you look at between the 1960s and the 1980s, um, where there were a few antibiotics, there was a huge, what we call a discovery void, right? That uh, for um, reasons, um, either it's political or economical or, you know, um, companies getting out of the game because the antibiotics work so well for a while and it's not uh, profitable to have these drugs that are um, not prophylactic, right? So they you basically get sick, you use them and they work so well. There wasn't an uh, incentive for companies to continue to to invent and develop and um, do research and development in this space. So this led to a discovery void, right? And so this is a huge problem where uh, antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest public health challenges of our time. And about 35,000 people die a year uh, from antibiotic resistance, right? So the turning point for me was in 2016, when a 70 year old um, um, woman um, uh, from Nevada, died uh, because she um, went, um, um, got infected with this bacterium um, and every single antibiotic they tried failed, right? And uh, so we have what is called last resort antibiotics. These are antibiotics that are used either in cocktail or by themselves where they're so toxic that I mean, that messes up your liver and your internal organs, et cetera. So you really don't want to use them unless you really, really have to. And even those fail. Right? So this um, individual died from a bacteria that is resistant to every single antibiotic um, that, that, is, that is used in a medicinal setting. Right? So the relevance of, of, of this kind of study right, is that the rise in a number of multi-resistant or antibiotic resistant bacteria such as MRSA, VRSA and others um, that cause a lot of diseases uh, has led to a significant rise in the morbidity and, and morbidity mortality, excuse me, of humans infected with pathogenic bacteria. And so how do we do this, right? And the CDC predicts that one, uh, we have one death every 15 minutes as a result of antibiotic resistance in this country, right? So we have about 70, 700,000 deaths per year, 2 million infections per year in the United States, 
um, the 700,000 is global, um, 35,000 um, in um, death in the United States, um, and one death every 15 uh, minutes or so. Right. So if you look at uh, the building blocks of proteins, right, we have these 20 molecules, um, 20 individual molecules called amino acids. We call them the proteogenic or proteinogenic amino acids. And humans can only, or animals in general, can only make 11 out of the 20, right? So nine of them we can't make. And these are highlighted by the ones in these black boxes here. The one um, I'm interested in is the lysine biosynthesis because lysine, um, in addition to being involved in protein biosynthesis, it's also in bacteria, it's also involved in cell wall biosynthesis or peptidoglycan in, in bacteria, right? So we hypothesized that inhibition of enzymes involved in amino acid biosynthesis, the essential ones, the nine ones that we cannot make, right? We cause a bacteriocidal or bacteriostatic effect in organisms that um, have to synthesize these organisms in order to grow. So we hypothesize these are new targets um, for antibiotic res um, resistance, right? And the, 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 the reason is because um, a lot of these genes are involved in not only protein biosynthesis for, with, as a proxy for amino acids, but they're also involved in other pathways that are unique to bacteria and not in humans as well, right? So I'll just briefly to go through the lysine pathway. We won't spend a lot of time. Well, there are, there are kind of two ways to make lysine. One of this kind of the, what we call the triple A pathway, right? Which I won't go through, but bacteria and fungi and plants and, and a few archaea use this, um, another pathway called the diamino, the diamino pimolate pathway in order to make um, lysine biosynthesis. So here I won't, um, as a biochemist, I won't bore you and, and go through the, the pathway, but you know, lysine is made from another amino acid called aspartate, right? And through a series of reactions, you ultimately make lysine here, right? And so what we did was we discovered a new enzyme by doing some assays, right? And we discovered uh, an enzyme um, um, that basically converts these three reactions uh, highlighted in the center here in pink, or red, I'm colorblind, so sorry if, if I don't get the colors correctly. Um, I think it's pink. Um, um, in one reaction, rather than um, using the three reactions that say E. coli would use, right? So we discovered a new pathway. And we've been developing our lab, we've been developing this organism called Vericomicrobium spinosum as a model organism to test our hypothesis. V. spinosum is actually a non pathogenic bacterium, um, it's actually the, the closest living, free living relative to chlamydia, right? Um, so the organism that causes the STD um, chlamydia. Um, and it's, um, it, it, it's it, we could grow it in the lab and it's non-pathogenic and it's safe to work with. So we've been using it as basically a proxy for working in, in the chlamydia um, um, species. So a long story short, we identified this enzyme that was involved in this one particular amino acid. Um, synthesis, and we basically screen compounds. What we did was we purified the enzyme, and we basically challenged the enzyme with 30,000 compounds, and we found out that four or uh, five of these, um, five of the compounds was able to inhibit the enzyme, and we could measure how basically how fast the enzyme works and, and, and how, um, how effective it is by challenging it with these compounds. So these are what we call lead compounds. These are actually drugs. So basically, we could use these as scaffold in order to develop drugs um, with, right? So one of the things in my lab that we do is called um, crystallization or uh, solving the structure. So what it, what it says is kind of um, analogous to, we purify the enzyme. So if you look at this gel here, this is the enzyme purified here. We run it through a column to make sure it's super, super pure, right? So we could get one singular peak here. So we know that it's pure. And then if we basically remove all of the aqueous or the water um, solution from the, the protein, what is left is these crystals here, right? So these are basically crystalline forms of the protein. And what you do is if you kind of um, shoot a, a X-ray beam through the crystal, what happened is that the X-ray will diffract or bend around right, the atoms, um, so forth. So it's analogous to if you hold up your hand in front of a light and you, the light passes and hits your hand, you're gonna cast a shadow on the back end, right? And then you're gonna ask the question, can you use the shadow, right, to render the image that was used to cast the shadow? So basically this, that's basically the whole premise of crystallography. So this um, um, diffraction pattern here is basically a series of dots and basically, so this is the basic of the shadow that was casted by the protein. And we're basically going to use the computer to basically connect the dots 
and render the dots into a three-dimensional image that was used to cast a shadow. So it's no different than if you go in front of a light, hold up the bunny ears, right? At the back end, you will see the bunny ears, right? You will see the shadow of the bunny ear, and then you're gonna ask the question, can I use a shadow to, re to recreate the image that was used to cast a shadow? So basically, that's the whole premise of X-ray crystallography, right? So here is this three-dimensional structure. So here is how the protein looks in three dimension, right? So you can see that it's, uh, uh, here's a monomer, the monomeric version of the, the protein. In B, you have the dimer, so it's a dimer. So basically two of two identical units interact to make this monomeric protein. And then we know what the architecture of the active site is. So all of these amino acids, tyrosine, glutamate, asparagine, lysine, et cetera, basically form the, the active site. So basically the active site is kind of like the, the middle of the lock, if you know what a key is, right? So the key is a substrate. And in the, the, in the, in the lock of the, the enzyme is the actual, um, um, where the substrate fits. So that will be the key. And so the, what we're asking the question is, can we basically design keys or, or, or discover keys that will fit into the lock but won't open the door? So basically that's what a drug is, right? And we were able to solve this because we solved the protein with good resolution. So it was solved at about 2.25 angstrom. So what that means is that if you look at these two pictures, right? You see these two pictures of the birds here. One is kind of look fuzzy and look kind of out of, um, out of um, not resolute. So you don't have a like, it's not sharp, it's not in focus. And one is super, super focused. So basically like the lower the angstrom, then the more focused it is, right? So you could basically know exactly what the atoms are and what the amino acids are. So you could basically fit um, substrates um, in between them. Right. So um, another recent project we've been doing in our lab is basically using um, um, organisms. And we do this by, uh, we, so we had this idea a couple years ago where a lot of the studies looking for natural um, products um, from organisms was done from soil um, bacteria or soil organisms um, and or organisms that grow very, very fast. So I had this idea one day of we're going to basically um, look for novel bacterium or bacteria, but we're gonna look for them in a very, very unique niche. So actually we just went to the pond at RIT. We have these series of ponds on campus and we went and we collected pond water. And uh, basically what we did is I devised what I call pond arbor. Basically it's this pond water. I basically add argon to it, autoclave it, and I make bacterial plates. Um, and then you pour the plate. So it's very, very minimal meat. It's just, there's not a lot of nutrients in it just to kind of facilitate fast growth of bacteria. So we eventually identified uh, a student of mine, um, a, a former alumna, um, Kayla Steiner, who is now a PhD student at Vanderbilt University. Um, it took four months for this bacteria to grow. So it's, it grows very, very slowly. But um, with that being said, this bacterium here uh, was able to produce a compound. We don't know what it is that we're trying to identify the compound now that actually killed, that's able to kill four different bacteria. So it was able to kill two, um, gram-negative and two gram-positive bacteria. And we know this because when we get extracts from the bacteria and we put these extracts on filter discs and challenge them to these bacterium, you see these halo around. That means they were, it's, um, it has a antibiotic effect to kill the bacteria. And we subsequently purified um, a series of um, um, compounds um, through FBLC or this kind of um, fractionation um, assay to basically identify the fraction that had these active active compounds and so forth, right? So, the, um, so one of the uh, research in my lab is basically try to find bacteria or other organisms that produce compounds to kill bacteria, right? And then we eventually will try to solve the structures and then we could take it, um, um, facilitate it and take it, um, take it from there. Right. So here are the references um, um, that we um, used. I, I would like to thank um, my collaborators, um, including all of my students and, and, and uh, colleagues. Um, so um, the majority of these um, students over the years, over the last um, 12 years or so have worked on some aspects of, of, our, of our research program. Um, many of them have um, gone on to um, done, um, do some wonderful things in industry and um, in, in science and the medical um, field. Um, some of them are actual doctors, uh, medical doctors and um, professors at other schools. And I actually um, kind of judge their growth by um, um, age, use that to, as a gauge for my age to see how um, old I'm getting. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, Dr. Redwood Dobson from the University of Canterbury, um, Dr. John Veteris from the University of Toronto, 
um, Dr. Didier Balanon from the University of Paris, uh, Dr. Greg Babbitt from RIT and Dr. Mike Safka from RIT as well. And the funding sources, the NSF, the NIH um, Bayer, um, and the Australian Synchrotron for giving me access to do um, crystal structures. And with that, I would love to take any questions. I am not seeing any questions at this point. So uh, Dr. Hudson, that was very fascinating, um, very informative. We appreciate you sharing your expertise and thank you at home for joining us this evening. Lastly, if you have not joined the RIT Alumni Association's social media channels, we really encourage you to do so, so that you can stay in touch with us. Ron is gonna put that in the chat box for us. And um, please feel free to join us. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Stay healthy, please stay in touch. Good night. Bye-bye, thank you.